I'm Will Dunning. I've been studying housing markets since 1982. The past 20 years I've been doing it as an independent one-person consulting company and uh, my time also includes 15 years working at CMHC in the housing market analysis function. I've been invited to talk to you for a little while to provide some background on the future of the home ownership sector. Now, uh, talking about the future, of course, is the bread and butter of an economist. We do that based on a little bit of science, but also an awful lot of opinions and expectations. I have to be really honest with you and tell you that uh, this is probably the worst it's ever been for me to perform my professional functions of providing opinions about the future. Uh, notwithstanding, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start by giving you an example that I th think illustrates some of the issues, and, and I hope that this discussion is germane to the discussion that you folks will be having uh, following this. I'm looking uh, on my desktop at a set of charts that look at the mortgage arrears rate for Canada. I've got a data set that runs from 1990 to 2020. You can see in this data set that historically the arrears rate in Canada has been low most of the time, especially during the past 15 years. At present, the arrears rate in Canada is under a quarter of a percent. The second chart uh, looks at what I think is one of the main drivers of mortgage arrears in Canada, which is the employment situation. This chart looks at the employment to population ratio for the prime working age group of 25 to 54, which of course is where most mortgage credit in the residential space resides in Canada. The third chart combines those two. So we're looking at the relationship between the arrears rate and the employment situation. And uh, another factor is, of course, also interest rates. So I've got separate charts for those, but those, frankly, are a lot less interesting than this one and uh, less less important to the storyline. So we're going to focus here. What we see is a pretty close relationship. When I put the data into a forecasting model, looking at 20 years of data, combining uh, a structured lag set for the for the uh, employment rate data and the interest rate data, my forecasting model explains about 75% of the movements in the arrears rate. So, you know, this is this is a reasonable forecasting model, which in normal times I would use with some confidence in developing a forecast. So if I were to do that today, and if I were to assume that interest rates stay where they are today, and the employment rate stays where it currently is at 72.6%, then I would expect that the uh, arrears rate in Canada would roughly triple from about a quarter of a point to about three quarters of a point. Now, uh, there are some issues here, of course. First of all, it depends on the assumptions I'm going to make about those those explanatory variables, uh, the assumption I make about the employment rate. And frankly, you know, I don't feel confident that I know what I should be assuming about that. So uh, I can arbitrarily assume that the future will be like the present. But what we've seen in the last little while is the future is often like the present, but there are times when the future is vastly different than the present. So uh, on this first score, I'm feeling very uneasy about developing any forecast whatsoever that relies on assumptions. Second factor here is that the coefficients, you know, the estimated impacts within this forecasting model are based on a set of data that changes gradually over time and by relatively small amounts. So it gives me a set of numeric estimates of what the relationships are. But we're now in a situation that is totally unprecedented where we're seeing a very large impact, a very, I mean a very large change within a very short period of time. So I should not have confidence that those parameters I've estimated based on the past in situations of gradual change should remain constant through a future of very abrupt change. So that's the second reason why I won't have confidence in my forecast. A third reason, uh, which is a somewhat different kind of reason, is that this is partial data. It's based on a data set from the largest banks in Canada, which represents about about two-thirds of mortgage residential mortgage indebtedness in Canada. don't have any data on a data of the third, and I have no knowledge that will tell me whether or not the parameters I'm adjust, uh, estimating based on this data will pertain to that of the third of the market. So I feel that even, you know, even if this model performs perfectly, it won't tell me about the, about the future for the entirety of the residential mortgage market. 
And then there's the fourth factor. You know, these are not, I've got two important variables in here, but these are not the only variables that will affect outcomes in the future. In fact, we have some variables right now that are unprecedented, which we cannot estimate in any way what the numerical impacts of them will be because we don't have any history for them. And those impact uh, effects are, of course, the interventions that are coming from government uh, in the form of providing um, income supports to people who are experiencing a disruption of their employment and also allowing for deferrals of mortgage payments for up to six months. So, uh, you know, we can we have an ongoing discussion now that's just developing about what's going to happen in six months from now to mortgage arrears, mortgage defaults, and so on, and the impacts within the broader housing market. What's going to happen when those mortgages that have been deferred for six months go over the cliff, as we may start to call it? And uh, so if I were to make do an analysis based on this data and these parameters and this situation, then I would be making an assumption that there will not be an extension of those mortgage deferrals. So I don't have any basis now for making an assumption about that as well. We, we may very well see that um, four or five months from now, uh, the continuing situation will cause the government to announce a further extension. We don't know what extensions might occur, how long those will go, just as we do not know how long is this health and economic crisis is going to last. So rather than talking about the future in explicit forecasting terms, I think I'm more comfortable doing what I think you folks are doing, which is to talk about contingencies. You know, what kinds of factors might be important in the future? How might those future those future factors evolve? What's the range of possibilities for the evolution of those factors? And then we can talk about policy contingencies. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I'm so here, we're interested in what's the likely path to the housing market, particularly to the home ownership segment. I've got uh, a lot of opinions, a lot of expectations, but I, I recognize that those are very much in idiosyncratic to me, and uh, I don't feel that I've got a really very powerful or accurate crystal ball to use here. So I'd much rather talk about what I think will matter in terms of producing outcomes and what we should be watching. So I've divided that into a, a few categories. First of all, on, on the lender side, the lender willingness to provide funding will, of course, depend on their assessments of risks, their appetite to take on those risks, and very importantly in these times is their ability to shift risk off their own books to elsewhere. So that could include securitization options, selling into the private market to investors, or also laying off risk to government through sales of assets or through mortgage insurance. So then we come to what's the willingness and capacity of government to take on that risk from the lenders. At this point, it is shown to be a very deep appetite and very cognizant of the need to continue to maintain liquidity within the financial system. So we'll have to watch how that evolves over time. If the longer this goes on, the more assets are on the government's books as, and uh, mortgage insurance fund, then uh, government will start possibly rethinking how much it's more it's prepared to provide. And, and that private sector may be under more pressure to take on more risk than it might perhaps be comfortable with. So that will affect outcomes. <laughs> then we have the consumer side. There's going to be objective circumstances that consumers face as a result of their situations that have occurred over the emergency period. There are also going to be less objective situations. What's going to happen to their attitudes? towards home ownership, their expectations about their own futures, their fears about their futures, their uh, beliefs about what's the value of home ownership versus renting versus continuing to live with their parents. All of these things are unpredictable, but they are going to be uh, amongst the most important factors to keep an eye on. <clears throat> and then for those who are interested in home ownership, what are going to be the mortgage regulations and how is that going to affect their capacity to consummate a transaction? We have the mortgage stress tests. We're learning increasingly that the mortgage stress test is done, done the wrong thing. It's looked at the impact of a, of a change in the interest rate. Well, really, the risk factor all along, as I've commented on already uh, earlier, the risk factor is what's happening to employment situations and incomes. The stress tests don't address that at all. But that's all beside the point. The stress tests are what they are, and uh, I think there will be a need for a lot of discussion about how those stress tests might change over the future. 
Uh, other regulatory issues are amortization periods. Uh, I'm one of those people who say that I'm not afraid of 30-year amortization for insured mortgages. The government has not yet uh, bought onto that, but it certainly, I think, will be up for discussion in the coming months whether that is a reasonable solution in the market environments we're going to be facing over the coming months and even the next year or so. And then there were down payment requirements. <clears throat> you probably know that a senior government official was in front of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance Tuesday last week and hinted that the government is interested in raising or at least considering raising the down payment requirement to 10% from the current 5%. I haven't heard any official commentary from the government on whether or not that's an opinion of government or whether really this was just the musings of an individual while he was acting in an official capacity. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. And then there's the whole area of renewals. I, I haven't noticed a whole lot of discussion about that, but I think it's going to be, as time goes on, an increasingly important uh, issue and an area that may become more fraught with perils. So I, I don't claim to have an exhaustive list here of the issues that are there, but uh, here's what I think. Uh, it should be on our minds. First of all, the current, the willingness of the borrower's current lender to provide a renewal on what terms. So that's going to reflect both the lender's assessment of its own capacities as well as the riskiness associated with that potential renewing borrower. Uh, so th th those assessments will result in the terms that it offers. There may be some situations, you know, I don't know how many, but there may be situations that are very highly stressful in which a renewing borrower is not offered reasonable terms by the current lender. So the question will be, what is the capacity of the financial system and the regulatory system to allow them to make a transfer? Um, there's certainly already one impediment within the regulatory system, which is that transferring mortgages have to be subjected to the stress test at a, an interest rate that we all know, uh, it's currently 4.94%, is very unrealistic as uh, any kind of expectation about what the future might hold. So uh, there'll be need for more discussion about the applicability of that stress test for transferring mortgages. And then another area, which I admit fully, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable, but I, th I think is an issue that uh, could become quite important, is the alternative lending space where lenders are um, relying on funds provided from a, a diverse set of sources, often private investors, sometimes more institutional investments. There's a risk that that funding could be dry up so that lenders may find that they're unable to renew the instruments they hold and the mortgages that they lend as those instruments come up for renewal. And uh, you know, that, that's a, a lot of risk that people with mortgages could find themselves without access to funding on any reasonable terms. Uh, that's something that uh, I, I'm not aware of it being an issue now, and it's not really a large part of the market. But I think if it becomes an issue, it could become a very, very powerful and, and dangerous issue that will need to be addressed by, by policymakers. And they'll need to find a means within the financial system or within their own lending capacities to replace funding that has disappeared. So moving uh, along to attitudes towards home ownership, <clears throat> I've observed for several years now, and maybe you have as well, that there are very different attitudes towards home ownership on the part of consumers versus on the part of the government. The survey work I've been involved in, as well as my own assessments and my interactions with, with people, confirm to me repeatedly that Canadians have a very high regard for home ownership in terms of the what it will provide to their long-term financial well-being, in addition to the myriad of other benefits of having stability in their lives for themselves and their families. <coughs> on the other hand, the government doesn't say it's uh, on, on a different page, but its actions certainly do say it's on an, another page because the regulatory changes we've seen since the fall of September 2008 have all created increasing impediments to home buying by Canadians, Canadians who feel that it's in their interest and who feel that they're qualified and capable of being homeowners and uh, maintaining, respecting their responsibilities and their obligations. So, um, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll have to see how that 
interaction works out, whether or not the government will become more receptive to the idea that home ownership is not just good for Canadians, it's also going to be an important part of the economic recovery to provide more assistance to enable qualified Canadians to become homeowners. And so could we possibly see some retrenchment on the economic policies, the, the regulatory policies that have become increasing impediments to home buying in Canada? Something else to keep an eye on is the distribution of the economic damage. The, the commentary that I've seen has painted very clearly that the job losses have been most concentrated amongst low-income groups and amongst the, the younger age groups. So the, the impact uh, on home ownership market is less dire, in a, it appears, than the impact will be within the rental sector, although there, there will be some impact across the entire spectrum of the market. But uh, something to watch related to this is what might happen to household formation rates as a result of a weakened employment situation where fewer people are able to maintain independent households. So um, compression of household formation rates would mean that there's going to be less need for new construction. Now, we've already experienced a decade of underproduction of new housing which has resulted in shortages and rapid price growth. So we could see a little bit of relief in, in that arena uh, for some time uh, until we see a, a really substantial recovery from the economic damage that has been experienced during the past few months. So the uh, I guess the last thing I want to say is that my priority will remain what it has been in terms of my research and my communications for the next little while, which is to talk about the stress tests. Uh, I think as part of an economic recovery package, it will be, really will be incumbent upon the government to discuss its expectations for the stress tests and the impacts of the stress test within the housing market. So I believe that's all I'm going to say for now, and I'll look forward to our discussions together. Thank you. Bye.